Welcome. It is great to be together for worship this morning here at Orchard Community Church. What a fantastic day, beautiful weather, great people to uh, fellowship with, and our great God to worship. My name is Matt. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, I'm the pastor here at Orchard, and we're so glad that you're here today. When we worship, God always meets us in that moment, so we can be sure that God will be amongst us today as we worship and we can look forward to that. Friends, pray with me as we open our service together. Let's pray. Mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you're doing in our lives and in the world. Let us marvel at the way that you provide for us and the good gifts you give. As we gather, may our worship glorify and honor you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let's stand and sing together. Tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. 
for the world to see nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see nobody but Friends, you can find a digital bulletin for this service on the YouVersion Bible app. There's also a link to that on the stream if you're watching us online and in our weekly email blast. Go to the, each of those places as well as our Facebook page and website to find out more about Orchard. We'd love for you to feel invited to participate in anything that you see there. A um, couple of things just to lift up to you. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. there's going to be a kids read and play event here for children and grandchildren. We'd love to have you participate that in that. In the children's ministry area, a couple of needs. We still need some help with cheer and dance camp that's coming up um, in August, and uh, Melinda and Lori will be on the patio, and we are also looking for a male camp counselor for kids camp. So men, who knows what the Lord is calling you to? You know, just saying, just saying. Um, our summer education series is going to begin this Wednesday, and it is on... Um, uh, Christian unity when we disagree on social issues, such a timely thing. Uh, we're going to begin this Wednesday evening at 6.30 with a screening of the movie Purple and a discussion to follow. Today, following church, after um, the lovely pro play prelude by Susan, we're going to show the trailer to Purple just to give you a taste of that. So hang around in here for a few minutes afterwards if you'd like to see that. We'd love for you to know that, uh, to take a look at that. Uh, just want to keep reminding you, we're going to be back out in the tent at the end of July through August 21st, so keep that in the back of your mind. Got a real uh, joyful announcement today. I want to ask uh, Lon and Debbie Herrera and Melinda to stand. I want to announce to you that the Whitney Tutoring Center at Orchard is going to reopen this fall. Yay! <laughs> With Lon as our director and Debbie assisting and uh, with Melinda as a, a member of a new uh, advisory board and we're just so excited after a year of that powerful ministry really not being up and running due to COVID to be back um, making a very significant difference in the lives of children and so um, Wanted to just let you know that, again, Lon's going to return as director um, with Debbie um, along with him, Melinda, and the uh, new advisory board. More specifics about the, the date and the uh, hours and more details will be coming soon. Um, but if you uh, feel led to tutor or you're thinking about it, now's the time maybe to, to, to pray about that. Or if you're raring to go, just shoot an email off and let them know that when the time comes, uh, you're ready to be a part of that. We'd love for you to do that. But I want to bring Melinda up to uh, have a word for our kids this morning, and she has yet another member of the Hoyt household with her today. We're, we're all here today. Good morning. Daisy came with me to church today because she was feeling really sad this week. She found out that one of her doggy friends had an accident and passed away. So she was really sad. And she knew that coming to church and being with her church family might give her some comfort. And we were talking, and she was um, reminding me of some of the good memories that she had with her doggy friend and a sleepover that they had one time. Her, her friend's name is Hazel. Some of you might have met Hazel before. Um, but she also remembered that Hazel knows about Jesus because she lives with a family that knows about Jesus. So she got a little bit more excited when she realized that she would get to see Hazel again. But boys and girls, um, I just want to say to you, if you've had a hard week or if you're missing somebody who has already died and you would like to talk with me and tell me your memories about that person, I would love to talk with you. And we can remind each other that we'll see each other again when we all get to be with Jesus.
All right, kids, we're going to go um, to Sunday school. My name is Jimmy Mack, and I'm the worship director here for any of you that I haven't met yet. Uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer today, so I'd like to go ahead and start uh, pr by praying for uh, Wes and Natalie. So if you would, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are mighty, you are glorious, you are wonderful, merciful, kind, caring. And the earth uh, in all of its splendor declares your glory. And Father, we are so thrilled that we are connected with you, the mighty creator of all things. And our hearts go out right now to Wes and Natalie and, and uh, their mission. We thank you, Father, that you have uh, touched them and um, commissioned them to go out into the world in the way that they are and, and face all of the trials that they face in order to spread your word throughout all the earth. And so, Father, we know that you've called us all to be your hands and feet on this earth, and they are definitely doing that. We are doing it in our own community here in our church and in our neighborhoods, and they are going out into the world and doing that in uh, much less comfortable environments that, that we're in. And we pray for all of our missionaries, all the missionaries that we've commissioned or that we support here from our church, and we pray all for all the missionaries throughout the earth that uh, we don't even know and may never know, but uh, they're doing your work, Father. So we ask for your uh, provision for them. We ask for your protection and touch our hearts in a way that we can come alongside uh, those people that are out there going to foreign lands and sharing your word. Touch our hearts in a way that we can figure out how we can support them, whether financially or just in prayer or any other way that we can. And Father, we pray for people in our church that are sick. We pray for our loved ones, our neighbors. Uh, Father, we, we ask your mighty hand of, of healing and, and health for those around us. We love you, God. We lift our voices in praise to you, God, and we, and we know that you're here with us. We know your Holy Spirit is here in this room and that you are pleased with our offering to you of our voices. And Lord, we also uh, pray for our offering. We have a wonderful opportunity to give back to you from all of the blessings that you've given to us. So Father, I ask you to bless this offering as our ushers come forward. Bless this offering to you as a joyful, cheerful gift. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This is a song that I wrote. It's called Completely.
a new song for us that I introduced last week. It's called You Say. We should live our lives in a way that we know what God says about us and get some of the bad thoughts that we have in our head about ourselves out and think about how God thinks of us. police officer pulled over um, a driver and asked for his license and registration one day, and the driver was kind of miffed. He said, 
I don't understand why you're pulling me over. I wasn't speeding. I haven't run a stop sign. I didn't run a red light. I don't, I don't understand what exactly is going on. And the officer said, oh, I, I know you weren't speeding. You didn't run a red light or anything like that. And, and, and so the, the driver said, well, what's the deal? Why did you pull me over? And he says, well, I was been following you for a while and I saw you kind of swerve around that lady who was driving slow and honk. And then I saw you uh, shake your fist in anger at another guy and slam your hand on the steering wheel at, at another driver. I saw all of this crazy behavior and then I looked down at your bumper and I saw this bumper sticker that said Jesus loves you and so do I and I figured this car had to be stolen. <laughs> so I was just checking it out. So it's a funny story but if you think about it for a minute it's kind of cringy too because it's true, right? It's true. Because as people of faith, we know when we're honest, there are days, there are bad days, and there are bad moments when we simply don't live up to the faith that we profess, the faith that we believe to be true. And we know why, don't we? We know it's because we're imperfect people, we're sinful people, we blow it, we make mistakes, we, we sin. As people of faith, we also know the truth that we have a God who forgives, that we have grace in Jesus. So we seek to do our best every day to live our faith for God as best we can and, and where we fall short to rely on the grace we have in Jesus. And that's what we should do. But there's always a danger. There's always a danger that we won't do that. There's a danger that we won't really live our faith, that it'll be something that we talk about, something that we believe up here, something that we come to church and sing about, but when it comes to living our life, we won't actually go out there and seek to do it, to live our faith every day. And if that happens, well, for one thing, at very best, our faith becomes this really weak ineffectual thing that doesn't really affect our lives or the world doesn't make any difference. And at worst, what happens is that our faith becomes this ugly thing and we become terrible hypocrites. And neither of those are things that we want to see happen. Well, today, this morning, we are wrapping up our series on the book of Hebrews called He is Greater Than All. We actually began this series back in January, and we took it all the way up until the season of Lent. We took a few weeks off at Lent, and then we got back to it after Easter. Any guesses how many have been in this series? How many messages? Eighteen. Longest series I think we've had here at Orchard, but it's been a really a good one. I've enjoyed every bit of it. And so as we uh, get into this last message, I'll say one last time. If you were to go out on the streets of Ventura and you were to pull people and ask them, what's the greatest thing in this life? You would get 100 different answers, 1,000 different answers. But the book of Hebrews has just one answer, and that answer is that Jesus is greater than all, greater than everything. And we've seen that repeated again and again. We've seen that Jesus is greater than the prophets, that Jesus is greater than the angels, than Moses, than, greater than Abraham, and, and so much more. We've seen that again and again and again. And a lot of what the author has covered in this letter has been very deep and theological. And that's been really wonderful. For example, it's been really wonderful and powerful to see the author go into great detail about how the things of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant led up to and led into the New Covenant and the New Testament. We've seen things from the Old and the New Testament fit together in ways maybe we'd never thought about. And that's been wonderful, but a lot of it, like I said, has been deep and theological, and that's good. But our faith isn't just a collection of things that we believe up here, is it? It's something that we're all supposed to, also supposed to live. And so, for that reason, with this last chapter, chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews, the author closes this letter by focusing on equipping us in really practical ways 
to follow Jesus and encourages us to go out and to live our faith, to put into practice what we know and follow Jesus every day. So we're gonna get into this last chapter. We're gonna get into those practical applications that the author has for us. So pray with me, friends, let's pray. Loving God, we just lift up our hearts to you and we're grateful for the book of Hebrews. We're grateful for its deep theological truth. We're also grateful for this passage, Lord, which is gonna point us towards living for Jesus every day in very practical ways, things that we need to do to experience a live and vibrant faith and to be lights in this world for you, Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to begin today in a little bit different way than we normally do. Normally we start at the beginning of a passage and we walk through it. But this morning I want to begin with verses 20 and 21, which are come later in the passage. And these words are sometimes called a doxology, which means a, a, a praise to God. They're sometimes called a benediction, which is a kind of a blessing. Um, you get a benediction at the end of the service. And both of those things are true. These are words of praise. This, these are words of blessing. This is a doxology and a benediction, but both of those things are, and what, what this, this, these words really are, is a prayer. And I want to start with this prayer because I think that it helps set the context for everything else that the author says leading up to this. Um, and, I, and I want us to be able to fit all those things into that context. So um, turn, if you've got your, your Bible, to um, Hebrews 13, uh, verses 20 and 21. It's also going to be on the screen for you to follow along there. <clears throat> and the author says this, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with, every good for, uh, with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us, what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. So verse 20, the prayer begins, and notice that, that the author refers to God as the God of peace. And we know that that's true. We know that God has sought to be at peace with us through Jesus' death on the cross, bringing us grace. God wants to be at peace with us. And we saw just last week that call of, in, this, in, the, in the passage for us as people who follow Jesus to seek to live at peace with others. We have a God of peace. The next thing that, that the author refers to Jesus is, or uh, the God as, as, is as the God who raised Jesus from the dead. He's a God of life. He's given us life and he gives us new spiritual life. We have a God of peace, we have a God of life, and then it says, um, finally, that our God, that, that Jesus is a great shepherd of the sheep. We have a God of peace, we have a God of life, and a God who wants to shepherd us as we live this life, wants to lead us and transform us along the way. And that's just the address. Now let's get to the heart of the prayer, and it's two things, verse 20, these two things are first, it says that the prayer is that God would equip us with everything we need to do his will. As we live this life, that God would equip us with everything we need to do his will. And then the second thing is that God would be at work uh, in us, in, in, the, in the first readers of this letter to whom it was written to and to us. And so if you really think about it, both of these things are about living our faith. For God to equip us to do his will is about us going out there and living the faith each day, doing his will. And the prayer that God would be at work in us is about us being um, open to God shepherding, that God would be working and transforming us as we live this life every day. This is the context of this passage. This is the reason for the, all the author says leading up to this. We've heard again and again throughout this letter that Jesus is greater than all, and now the author is saying, okay, now that you really got that, it's time to take your faith into him out in into the world and live it. That's the context of this passage and we really see that come through in the prayer. So now let's go back to the start, knowing that context and to walk through this passage and I want us to look at the first six verses as we get moving here. And the author says this, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers for by doing 
For by so doing, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all sexual immorality. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember, or that, or, or stop there, sorry, I was gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. I get excited. I just wanna take it all, one big, one big bite, it's too much. So with this in mind, um, the author begins here by calling us to three things. Three things right out of the gate that we need to do to live our faith in relation to one another. First one, it says, verse one, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And I want you to notice that it doesn't say start loving one another, does it? It says keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters because as followers of Jesus, that is an expectation. It is an expectation that we would reflect God's love in the way that we live with one another. And you know, we do have a good sense of love among the family of believers here at Orchard, and I'm really grateful for that. But we can't assume that that will just continue without some effort on our part. We have to proactively choose to keep on loving one another. That's what we need to do to live our faith together here. We wanna love one another because Jesus first has loved us and because he calls us in turn to love one another. And this is a key part of what it looks like for us to live our faith and not just talk about it on Sunday mornings. Second, verse two, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. This is a call for us not just to care about our clique, our group, our people, but to care about other people outside of our group. The Greek word for hospitality here literally means love of stranger. That's, that's what it literally means. So the author uh, um, is, is calling for us to welcome, to care for, to love, everybody, not just our people. And, and the author throws in this little encouragement, and it's an allusion to the Old Testament, to Abraham and Lot, who both um, showed hospitality to strangers, who in the end ended up being angels. And of course, that would be very pleasing to God, seeing us doing the right thing. And I was thinking about these angels, they're kind of like mystery shoppers, aren't they? You know how they have those in stores that go in and sort of test out the customer service? I mean, I think it could kind of be that way, you know, that we could have that same experience. And I, and I want us really to remember something, something that Jesus said in Matthew 5. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And what Jesus means is it's, it's easiest to love the people who love us, to love our group, to love our family, to love our friends. It's, that's the easy part. But if you wanna do something that's really meaningful in God's eyes, Go out there and love people outside your group. Go out there and love people that are difficult to love. Man, that really is exciting. That's the kind of thing that God really wants to see us doing. That is really living our faith, really putting these words into action. Because it's easy to talk a good game about loving everybody and not do it. We gotta do it. Verse three, number three, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them and those who were mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. So the author is referring here primarily to those who are in prison for their faith. And we need to keep that in mind. Now, prison ministry to those who have committed crimes is also a really important ministry for us, but that's not the focus here. Um, in our place and time right here, People don't get put in prison for their faith. But throughout the history of the world, that has happened millions of times, and it is still continuing to happen today. And we need to remember that that is a truth for many believers around the globe. But there is a, another call here, and, it, and it's really a call about love. And it's a call for us to continue to love other people, not just when it's easy, 
But when life gets hard, when life gets really messy, when you're a Jewish Christian in the Roman world and your friend gets put in jail for their faith, you're supposed to keep on loving and maybe associate yourself with them in a way that they start wondering if you're one of those Christians that should be put in jail too. There's risk. But we're supposed to keep on loving even when it's hard, even when it's risky. Remembering, notice it says, remembering our own struggles remembering our own messes and how much we needed people to be for, there for us when we were going through our difficult times. This too is how we are to live our faith. So right out of the gate, kind of a threefold call to love. Love one another, love the stranger, love when it's hard. This is what our faith is about in very practical means. Verse four, the author moves to the subject of marriage and really marital love. It says marriage should be honored by all not just those who are married, by everyone. Marriage seems to be less and less honored today. Many people think of it as kind of disposable. You know, it's not, in many marriages, not as long as we both shall live anymore. It's as long as we both shall love. And when we stop loving, so does the marriage. And that's not God's design. But our actions, our hopes and our actions should always be aimed at supporting marriages, at encouraging people who are married. Because when marriages fail and divorce happens, damage comes. People are damaged by that, especially children. And we should all want for that not to be the case. So we need to encourage people towards strong and lasting marriages. And then the author gives a warning against one of the most damaging things to a marriage, which is infidelity, saying the marriage bed should be kept pure. We have to encourage, support people in the right way. The author also warns that that God judges these things. God judges those who commit adultery, that God judges sexual immorality Now, we know as believers that we have grace. We know that. But I think what the author is trying to do is impress upon us the importance, the gravity of these things. God cares about these things. You might think that God doesn't care what goes on in your bedroom or in in, in, in outside of the public view, but God does care about those things. We also know there's grace, but God does care care about them and that's so important for us because we live in a culture that has devalued sex so greatly to say that those things don't really matter and God wouldn't really care and God does. Verse five, the author touches on money. Not much of a concern, right? With inflation and recessions going on. The big concern here is how we can so easily develop a love for money that becomes our greatest love a greater love than our love for God. And we can begin to look to money and not to God for our contentment, for our security. And money really can become like a drug for us. It gives us a high when we get it, and no matter how much we get, it's never enough, is it? They've actually studied this, do you know this? They've done research, and what they find when they poll massive numbers of people and they ask them questions is that most people in different ways kind of communicate that no matter how much money they have, whether they make 30 or 60 or 120 or whatever, no matter what their income level is, most people, when they really get down to it, if you ask them the question, how much money is enough, they say, I just need about 10% more, and that would be enough. There's a problem with that, though, you know? You know what it is? When they come back to them a few years later and they have gotten a 10% raise, you know what they say? I just need 10% more. It's never enough. It's no matter how much we get, it's never enough for us. And what the author is, is, I think, really wanting us to see here is that rather than money, the thing we really need is Jesus. And that he's enough. And that we can find real true contentment in him. We'll always have to contend with money, we'll always have to make a living, those things are real, they're not unimportant, but real and true contentment comes from Jesus and the author doesn't want us to miss that as we seek to actually live this faith in the world, that we're pursuing Jesus first 
and not money. Now, in light of this, the author calls us to be content knowing that God has promised never to leave or to forsake us. One of the great promises of the Bible, that's from Deuteronomy 31.6. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God will always be there for us. The author then elaborates that in verse six, basically saying we can depend on God. Offering another quote, Psalm 118.7 says, God is our helper, so we don't need to be afraid. We can trust in God, we can rely on God. He will provide for us, so we do not need to fear in this life. Finally, it says, what can mortals do to me? Now, the the harm that people can do to us is real. And we would sure hope that we wouldn't suffer. We would sure hope that we wouldn't lose our life because that could happen. That's the kind of harm that mortals can do to us. And yet, as people of faith, we know that God holds eternity in his hand. We know that God has a plan for us no matter what happens. And there's a promise uh, in the scripture that what God holds for us is so much better than this life. That we can live trusting him. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory which has been revealed. What God has for us is so much better than what this life has to offer that we need to keep our eyes on that. That's what the promise is. And I was thinking about this, and you know who I was thinking of that's living this boldly right now? Well, I think we got a couple of you right here. I mean, stepping into a difficult situation, but somebody I was thinking of was Nita Hansen. Nita Hansen just went back to Ukraine because she knows that's where God wants her. And you've heard there's a little dust up in Ukraine, right? I mean, Nita knows a rocket could hit her house any minute and she could die. But she knows that's where God wants her. And she's keeping her eyes on God's greater promise rather than worrying about the things of this world. And that's pretty awesome faith, isn't it? that we would all aspire to be like Nita. Nita, if you happen to be watching the live stream, just amen to you. Well, let's look at the next section of our scripture, verses 7 through 19. The author continues and says this, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others uh, for which such sacrifice as God has uh, is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you, you to pray that I may be restored to you soon. So verse 7 Basically, the author says, remember the teachings and follow the example of faith of your leaders. And we all need examples of faith. We all need mentors in our lives, those that we can look to to show us what a a life of faith looks like and who can encourage us along the way. Those who lead us maybe in in, um, more... uh, 
uh, formal positions as, as elders or teachers in the church, but even those who lead us in more informal ways by being prayer partners or mentors in our lives, we need that. So Mike, one question would be, who is that for you? Who do you look to? And yet, as much as we need people to uh, play that role in our lives, our greatest teacher, our greatest example is Jesus. We look to him above all others. Following his teaching and his example is the greatest equipping that we can have for our life and for our faith. In verse 8, the author continues saying, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust in the consistency of Jesus' character. He's always going to be the good Savior that we need, the good shepherd that we need. And for the consistency of his promise, what he has promised will always be true and available to us. We can count on him as we seek to live our life of faith in the world. Verse nine, the author says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. And that's just always a constant danger in this world. There are so many uh, different, strange, odd teachings about life and faith out there. And we always have to be on guard against them. Some are even present as biblical when they are not. But here, the author actually has something particular in mind. And what the author has in mind is some teaching that he's encountered that is calling these early Jewish Christians, that's who Hebrew was written to, it's calling these early Jewish Christians to go back to the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And we've, we, we've talked about these early Jewish Christians, how some of them had um, begun to follow Jesus, but now we're kind of wondering if maybe they should turn back to Judaism. But going back to Judaism and all of its purity codes, the author wants them to know, is going back to trying to be good enough for God on your own and never being able to do it. And so the author says we, to, the, to the readers and to us, you don't have to do that. We don't have to do that because we have Jesus. And in Jesus, God did something amazing. Through Jesus' death on the cross, we have God's grace. And God's grace makes us good enough. At the heart of Christian faith, it's not about what we can do for God. At the very heart of Christian faith, it's about what God has done for us in Jesus. Of course, we're going to do things for God out of gratitude, but that comes later at the heart. It's about what he's already done for us. Verse 10, the author says, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Now, the meaning of this verse has been debated by scholars. There's a lot written on it, Um, but I think what the author means is this. I think the author means that Jesus and the new covenant that we have in him are just seriously greater than the old covenant and the priests of the old covenant who enforced all of those dietary codes. You see, the priests who served at that altar and who uh, carried out all those purity codes, they were attractive to the readers because of their Jewish heritage. They'd grown up with this. It was what fam- was familiar to them. So they, they would naturally maybe kind of gravitate back to that. But the author is reminding them th- that, that they have and we have something so much better. We have an altar in heaven where Jesus is in the throne room of God acting as our priest on, on, on our behalf. And I think the point here is what what the author is saying is if those priests knew that, they would want it too. If they they knew it, they would want it too. And if if they knew it, when it comes to food, they wouldn't be interested in these dietary codes. They'd want to come to the communion table. And they'd want to share in that meal. So verses 10 or 11 and 12, the author makes another comparison of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, normally, the Jewish priests could eat the meat sacrificed in the temple, but not on the Day of Atonement. And that's what's being talked about here. On the Day of Atonement, any of the sacrifices, they were taken outside the camp or the city, and they were burned. And the author sees a correlation between this. Those sacrifices were burned outside the city. Jesus was crucified outside the city. Jesus is our sacrifice, those sacrifices. So the author sees this correlation and then makes a kind of a theological move in verse 13. The author calls the readers to be willing to symbolically go outside the city and join Jesus in his suffering. 
And what, the, what he's talking about for them is he's saying, be willing to, to leave behind your Judaism and join Jesus as a follower, knowing that you may be persecuted for that, that you may suffer. Go, are you willing to, to follow Jesus and maybe to suffer with him because Christianity was illegal at that point? And I think there's a larger sense here, a larger word here though. It's not just about them and their context, it's about us and our context. And I think the larger word here is about all believers in every time and place being willing to step out of places of safety in order to live boldly, to live our faith boldly. And why would we do that? Why would we be willing to step out from where it's safe into where it's unsafe because of our faith? What would, what would motivate us to do that? Verse 14 says, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. And this is the same language the author used in verse 11 to say that we don't live for this world and these cities. That we were made for something more, for something greater, and that's what we live for. In fact, Jesus said very clearly, we are not of this world. And because we are not of this world, because we live for something more, we should be willing at times to step out of the safe places into the risky places to boldly live our faith. To follow Jesus even when it's gonna mean that we might suffer disgrace just like he suffered disgrace for us. And I think we need to really remember that in our context right here in Ventura, the stakes for us are really low in comparison to those ancient believers. I mean, their stakes for them were huge. They could be thrown in prison. They could be executed for the faith. And they did it anyways. And we can live with that kind of boldness too. Now, in the new covenant with Jesus, animal sacrifice was no longer necessary in the temple. Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice. We don't, we don't need to make sacrifices for sin anymore. But the author says there are still some sacrifices that we can give to God that are good to give to God. Verse 15, the author mentions a sacrifice of praise, lifting up our hearts in worship, which we just happen to be doing today, right here. That's a good thing. God loves to receive our worship as a sacrifice of praise. Verse 16 the sacrifice of doing good works in Jesus' name. But again, I just want us to be really clear. We don't do these things to earn God's love and acceptance. We do these things out of gratitude for the fact that God already loves and accepts us. We live our faith forward in this life out of gratitude. Verse 17, the author touches on our life together in the church. It says we're to obey our church leaders and submit to their authority. Now, we do this not because our church leaders are so great, not because they're so holy, they, they may be holy, but we do this because their call is to lead us by God's word and because they've been appointed as shepherds to do that, to lead us in God's place. And so we're to submit and we're to obey them. And this is true for everybody, including me. Now, as the pastor, I am a leader of this church. I'm a member of the board of, of elders. I moderate the board of elders. We call it the session here. But I also am under the board's authority. I'm accountable to the board, just like you are. I need to obey the elders and submit to what they say, just like you do. And that is a good thing. And not just because it makes the church run well. It does make the church run well when we do it. But you know what? There's something just as important there. And, and what it is is that we're better believers when we obey and submit. Those are biblical principles that every Christian is called to. It's a good thing when we have accountability. It's a good thing when we are obedient. It is a good thing when we are willing to submit to those in leadership um, over us. And when we do, we grow into mature believers. And if we don't obey and submit, we stunt our own spiritual growth. 
Now the author reminds us that leading in the church is a high calling, one to which leaders are held accountable to Jesus. That's kind of scary if you think about it. You elders, the Lord has said you're gonna be accountable to me for the way that you ran Orchard Community Church. So no pressure, right? No pressure. But, but it's a high calling and it's important and we should take that very seriously. Now the author also calls us to obey uh, our elders so that their work is joyful and not a burden because that would be of no benefit to us. And it wouldn't, we love this church. And we don't want our leaders to be stressed out dealing with those kinds of things. We want them to be energized, um, full of excitement and vision to lead us forward. That's what we really want. The author is absolutely correct there. Verse 18, the author asks for prayer, especially in verse 19 that, that the author might return to be with them sometimes. And it's an interesting thing because we know this author, right, is brilliant and a, and a super great theological mind and a faithful person. And here the author says that they and their partners, that they have a clear conscience, they know they're doing things right, they know they're living for God, and yet despite all that, the author doesn't say, so I got this covered on my own. The author says, I need you to pray for me. Because godly people understand that living a life of faith is also about prayer. We need to be about prayer. And in verses 20 and 21, the author practices what he or she preaches and prays for the readers, and that's the prayer we covered at the beginning, that God would equip them to do his will and that God would be at work in them in verses 20 and 21 as they live their faith in the world. Verse 22, the author says, you should bear with this, meaning really listen to what's in this letter. Really do it. Really put it into practice, although there's a side note there. I could have written a whole lot more. <laughs> wow, 18 sermons already. <laughs> could have been twice as long. The letter concludes in the last few verses, verses 23 through 25, and the author offers some personal greetings, and I, I won't go into those. You can, you can take a look at those, but I want to end with this. Once upon a time, there was a town, and this town was uh, populated exclusively by ducks. All the citizens of the town were ducks. And every Sunday morning, all of the ducks would leave their duck homes and they would waddle down their duck streets to their duck church. And they would come in to their duck pews and they would sit down and then the duck choir would come in and they would take their places and the duck minister would come in and read from the duck Bible and he would begin to preach his duck sermon. And his duck sermon was something like this. Ducks! God has given you wings, wings with which you can fly, with wings you can mount up like eagles. No walls can confine you, no fences can hold you. You have wings, God has given you wings, you can fly like birds. And all the ducks would get so excited and they would shout, hallelujah, amen, preach it duck brother. You know, they were really into it. And then when the sermon was over, they would all waddle back home. And our hope, is not to be like those ducks. Our hope is not to be people who just talk about our faith, who just come to church and say words that we have no intention of living. That is our hope. Our hope is to be people who really follow Jesus in this life, who really live our faith, remembering that Jesus is greater than all. Amen. Pray with me. Loving God, we, we pray earnestly that the faith that we have would not be simply contained in ideas in our minds, but would be something that affects our whole life and especially the way that we live, that we would be people of love and grace who follow you and who realize at every moment that Jesus is leading us and that he is greater than all. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If my heart is overwhelmed and I cannot hear your voice, hold on to what is true, though I cannot see. If the storms of life they come and the road ahead gets steep, I will lift these hands and pray. I will.
hope and every promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me Thank yes before you God not ducks. <laughs> we don't sound like ducks. Friends, just a reminder, in a couple of minutes after the prelude, they're going to show the trailer for Purple. If you want to stay around and watch that, we'd love for you to do that. And also, there's going to be some folks over in the west wing of the church ready to pray for you. And I really encourage you to go and to take advantage of that and be prayed for. But friends, as we go forth from this place, let us remember that we are called to a faith that is not just ideas we believe, but a faith in Jesus, a relationship that we live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen.